I uh, should speak about what is an armed conflict, and this is a specificity of international humanitarian law that it applies only to armed conflicts, and therefore it's decisive uh, whether we have an armed conflict, because otherwise humanitarian law does not apply. My first point is perhaps about, uh, I see so many faces of experts that I don't dare to say it, but perhaps for the few people who are not experts, to clarify who decides, because I most often ask this question. Um, and I have to tell you, it is not the states concerned who decide uh, finally whether there is an armed conflict or not. So when there is an armed conflict uh, in the ICC, I don't speak about countries, so utopia, there is an armed conflict in utopia, and Nirvana supports some rebels uh, in uh, Utopia, and the question is first, is there a, a non-international armed conflict in Utopia, or is it even an international armed conflict because there is such a support of these rebels? It's neither Utopia nor Nirvana who have the final say. Everyone, every subject of international law, all international organizations, the ICSC, every scholar, uh, can have an opinion about this, but obviously they cannot impose their opinion on Utopia and Nirvana, because Utopia and Nirvana, if they say there's no armed conflict, what the others say is not decisive, because we are in international law where most of the time we don't have a court or a body deciding. The same thing is if in a hypothetical Gulbekistan, uh, 100,000 troops are fighting against terrorists, and the government of Gulbekistan says uh, these are simply uh, terrorists and there's no armed conflict in our country. It is, since 1949, no longer the case that it is Gulbekistan deciding whether there is an armed conflict, but no one else can impose on Gulbekistan the classification. So let's look what is an armed conflict, and in my view there is no unique definition of armed conflict, but there are international armed conflicts, these are armed conflicts between states, and there are non-international armed conflicts, which are armed conflicts between armed groups, or between an armed group and one, 15 or 100 states on the other side. So decisive is not where it happens, but who are the parties? to determine whether it's an international or a non-international armed conflict. And I start with international armed conflict. The first uh, question is the triggering act, the nature of the triggering act. Uh, in my view, there, it is necessary that there is a use of force, but every use of force between states triggers an international armed conflict. This is not uncontroversial. In the Picte commentary uh, of the ICSC, um, it is said that also the capture of a soldier is sufficient to trigger an international armed conflict. Sounds good, but uh, the theory behind it is that IHL applies uh, as soon as a situation arises for which there are rules. But there are also rules in IHL on the detention of civilians and the treatment of sick people. You cannot say every time someone is sick um, uh, there is an armed conflict, nor every time someone, uh, a foreigner, is uh, arrested. Uh, therefore, I think at the basis there must be a use of force. While I, under, I agree with uh, the ICSC commentary and the ICSC that uh, for international armed conflicts, this can be very low. The first shot, as Picte uh, has written, this is not uncontroversial. The International Law Association has adopted a report which adopts a unique concept of armed conflict and says there is need of a certain level of violence and otherwise there is no uh, international armed conflict. And at least when we hear what states say, they indeed don't call international armed conflict everything which uh, 
uh, means violence between two states, but they may have used ad bellum arguments, and as we say in Latin, falsa demonstratio non nocet, in the sense it's not a terminology used by the parties, which is uh, decisive, then from whom must it come, this violence? Uh, this is uh, everyone who is attributable to a state. If that person is not uh, declared by a higher authority as not uh, representing the state, the state is then nevertheless responsible, but there is no international armed conflict. I always give the example of my son, who is a Swiss soldier, as all Swiss men, and if he is drunken and on the French border, he kills a French soldier, and immediately his uh, commander says, we are sorry, then there was no international armed conflict. Between, sorry, I mentioned two countries, uh, <laughs> but you understand. Okay, and this is quite the majority opinion, which is uh, something where I have adopted a minority opinion after teaching for years the opposite, uh, and it was one of my doctoral students who convinced me, is the target. In my view, um, when a state is specifically targeting an armed group in another country, even if that country doesn't consent, that's a violation of the UN Charter, obviously, except if it is in self-defense, but it is a non-international armed conflict, while the majority opinion is that as soon, and this is what I uh, taught to generations of students, so I feel uh, so sympathetic to this opinion. The majority opinion is as you, soon as you use force on the territory of a non-consenting state, um, there is an international armed conflict. I think the rules are simply not appropriate. Say, today, uh, sorry, I mentioned countries, US attacks on the so-called Islamic State on the territory of Syria, if we um, assume that uh, Syria does not consent with them, the rules of international armed conflicts are not really appropriate to that. And therefore, while the use ad bellum uh, applies, obviously, uh, in use in bellum, I would apply the law of non-international uh, non armed conflicts. And with that, we come to non-international armed conflict. Uh, non-international armed conflicts uh, need a higher level of violence because while, fortunately, it's not normal between states to use force, it is normal that there is uh, violence within a state. And fortunately, not every violence in a state is an armed conflict, because in an armed conflict you can do many more things which would be prohibited in uh, peacetime. And in addition, the armed group must have a minimum level of organization, which is quite a level of organization. There is a controversy whether there is a third criterion, which is a political aim. Uh, I have some sympathy in theory for the idea that if the aim is purely drug dealing, this is not an armed conflict, but it creates great problems of application. And every state will then say, our rebels, this is not a political aim. They are simply criminals. And then you have to discuss, is this criminal or not criminal, and are they terrorists, and so on. And therefore, I think political aim, and it's nowhere in the texts that the political aim is decisive, and how do you define political aims, and so on. So, then protocol additional two has a higher level. Uh, you must control territory, and it must be a conflict between uh, governmental forces and uh, rebel forces. Um, then uh, some conflicts, uh, to some non-international armed conflicts, the whole of international humanitarian law applies, which is uh, if there is an agreement between the parties or if there is a recognition of belligerency, which must be expressed by the government. Now, how can a conflict be mixed? Obviously, many conflicts are mixed. Uh, there, here we have two situations. Either if a state has overall control, this was the case of Nova, Nirvana and Utopia, has overall control over rebels in a neighboring country, then in reality, this is an international armed conflict, one single 
international armed conflict. Another possible situation is if we have uh, an intervention uh, of a state in a non-international armed conflict without control over the, the armed group, then we have two conflicts. We have the conflict between the armed group and the government and an international armed conflict between the outside state intervening against the state and in favor of the armed group, while when outside states intervene in favor of the government, the conflict remains a non-international armed conflict. Uh, finally, I forgot something of certain actuality. Um, among the international armed conflict, there are two specific situations, belligerent occupation. So if uh, Utopia occupies uh, a peninsula of Nirvana, even if there is no armed resistance, uh, the law of international armed conflict applies, and second, national liberation wars, in which a people is fighting against uh, foreign occupation, colonial domination, or a racist regime is, at least under Protocol 1, an international armed conflict. And I conclude by saying that somehow these distinctions between what is an armed conflict, what is an international and non-international, sound embarrassing, uh, especially for humanitarians, because they can invoke the rules only once they have classified the conflict. And the other, the state, has a first line of defense saying, we are not in an armed conflict today. Switzerland doesn't have to comply with the Third Geneva Convention, because there's no armed conflict. And so, if Gulbekistan says there's no armed conflict, it doesn't have to comply with IHL. But, the distinction is states like this distinction. It is, in my view, inherent in the Westphalian uh, system. And it has also some advantages for the persons affected by armed conflict, because precisely when there is no armed conflict, things are prohibited, which are at least not prohibited in uh, armed conflicts like uh, to kill deliberately people or to detain people without judicial control for an indefinite time, which is uh, prisoner of war status. And even between international and non-international uh, armed conflict, I think, but here I'm nearly a minority, this is a minority opinion, that it's also in the interest of uh, victims that the two are not governed by the same detailed rules, because anyway, armed groups could never respect those rules. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, because this allows me on the first issue to uh, correct the wrong impression I have given. My point about every use of force was about international armed conflict. For non-international armed conflict, you need a level of violence, which in my view is quite high. Here I'm not in agreement with Pictet. Simply at the time of Pictet, humanitarian law was all we had. While today we also have human rights law. So we have to take, and this is not a policy. I never make policy. Policy, no. Uh, it's not policy, it's law, because law is interpreted in the context of the rest of international law. And the fact that we have other rules allows us to interpret the inter applicability of existing rules. So, this was for international armed conflict, non-international armed conflict, we have a higher level of violence. And I would say, if, uh, and we all hope for that, uh, what you hope happens in Colombia, there's no more armed conflict. Because the violence by the uh, drug dealers is not of a sufficient level, and the important point, in my view, is, which should r make you relax, is that, as far as I know, all the drug dealers are not one party. So, if you are correct, you have to take each group and analyze whether the hostilities between that group, and it's not the drug dealers, it's the armed group of the drug dealers, it has a sufficient level of violence 
to be a non-international armed conflict. And here's the big difference with Afghanistan. The drug but they fight against each other, while basically the Taliban, there are dissensions and so on, but they are one party to the conflict. And so uh, while out of this very justified concern you have to say, let us introduce the criterion of a political aim, and as I said, I have some sympathy for it, uh, perhaps because I'm from the 1968 generation. Political aims are for me somehow noble, and people who want to deal with drugs are not noble. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I must say, an in international reality, otherwise, uh, how every government has. Uh, or nearly every government has a good case to say, you know, these people are only criminals. And then you have, perhaps because I was an ICSC delegate, I imagine myself negotiating with the government and saying, no, no, these are not only criminals, these are also people who have a political aim. And then how do you define it? Is it sufficient that they declare a political aim? Or do we have to make a nice seminar at the Graduate Institute about, because the University of Geneva doesn't deal with such issues, uh, about <laughs> whether this is genuinely political? Um, so you see the point. The, the result is exactly the same you want to reach, but I wouldn't add the political aim as a criteria.